Hello beautiful people and welcome. In today's video I am going through some of the questions on your chapter 4 review homework. Now I'm not going to be doing every single question. I will be doing one question from each group. So sometimes a group will be a similar chunk of six questions or a similar chunk of four questions or it could be just two questions. Let's go ahead and start with question number let's do question number four. So on question number four, it says to simplify. And it's asking us to simplify negative eight times the square root of 32 x y squared z to the fourth power. Now when I do my radicals, I do like to put that little tail on the end of it so I know what's inside and what's outside. Notice that we are doing a square root here. We're going to separate things out. So we got a negative 8 times the square root of 32 times the square root of x times the square root of y squared and times the square root of z to the fourth power. We're going to continue splitting this up. Now the way that I like to, use, to uh, work with variables and radicals is I always like to convert them into a rational exponent, which means it's an exponent that is a fraction. I like to convert them. You don't have to convert them if you don't want to. Here I'm going to continue splitting up 32. And we want to know what two numbers multiply to 32 when one of them is a perfect square. Now what is a perfect square? Perfect square, let's do a little thinking bubble. A perfect square, oop, sorry. A perfect square is where you have a good, pretty answer. So for example, 4 is a perfect square because the square root of 4 is 2. Another perfect square is 9 because the square root of 9 is 3. And so we can write these out just a few and see which one of these perfect squares is a factor of 32. So if you'd like to use a calculator for this, you can. We would do 32 divided by, let's say, for example, 25. Now this doesn't give us a pretty answer. It gives us a decimal, so we don't want that. 32 divided by 16, that does give us a pretty. Now you do want to choose the largest factor. You don't want to choose something like 4 uh, if the other number that you get here can be simplified further. So you want the largest number. Simplifying that out, we have negative 8 times 4 times the square root of 2. So that's it for the numerics. We still have the variables. Now like I mentioned earlier, I do like to rewrite these as a fraction exponent, a rational exponent. And where does that 2 come from? The 2 comes from the index. That denominator of 2 is your index. Now the reason I like to, oop, that should be a 2, do a fraction exponent, a rational exponent, to me it's a little bit easier to see how I can simplify it. So for example, this one I cannot simplify because it's just one half. One half cannot be simplified. This one can be simplified because 2 divided by 2 is just 1. This one can be simplified because 4 divided by 2 is 2. Now what does that mean for your radicals? If you end up with a fraction, a fraction like 1 half, that ends up being a radical. If it is not a fraction, like for example 1 and 2, since those are not fractions, then that means they do not belong inside the radical and they go outside. So let's go ahead and solve or write our answer. So we have 8 negative times 4, that is negative 32. We also have a y to the first power. If you want to not write 1, that's fine. And then we have z squared. So all of that is outside the radical. Now what is inside the radical? Inside the radical we have a 2, and inside the radical we have an x. Now why is x going inside? Because we do have that fractional exponent, but we also need to rewrite this as x to the first power being square rooted. Now be careful, sometimes when you simplify your fractions, the denominator changes, your index changes, and so when we're writing our final answer, the index needs to be the same for anything on the inside. So this would be your answer for question number four. Moving on to the next section. Next section we have, let's do question number 10. 
Let's shift this up. For question number 10, again, the instructions are to simplify. But with simplifying, they are asking us to do 3 cube root of 5 minus 2, all divided by 4 cube root of 18. Now, we did do this question in class, and we did take the longer route. So I'm going to try to show you a little bit of an easier way to do cube roots when you need to rationalize the denominator. So step number one, we need to simplify. So I'm going to write out my perfect cubes here. And I did a little bit of a larger thinking bubble. It doesn't have to be that large. So perfect cube, what does it mean to be a perfect cube? So if I do one cubed, that's one. But if I do two cubed, that's eight. So that means this cube root, sorry, the cube root of eight is two. Now if I do three cubed, that means the cube root of 27 is 3. And if I do 4 cubed, that means the cube root of 64 is 4. And if I do, well, you guys get the pattern, oops, did that backwards, 5 cubed, we get cube root of 125 is equal to 5. Now I'm going to stop there because the these numbers are already too big. We just have an 18 and a 5. And I'm looking, can we simplify anything here? Well, the only number that can go into 8 18 is 8, and so they don't get along. We can't simplify that. 5 cannot be simplified. So that means we have to rationalize the denominator. Now, rationalizing the denominator means you're going to take this section here, that denominator, and we want to make it to where we can simplify it. This is a little bit different when you have a square root versus a cube root. Now, for a cube root, you can take 18 cube rooted, and multiply it top and bottom twice. So two cube roots of 18 and two cube roots of 18 here and here. Or what we didn't do in class that I'm showing you now is we want 18 to be one of these numbers. Again, we want 18 to be one of these numbers. So what do I need to multiply the cube root of 18 by to get one of these numbers? So for example, if I do 18 times five, that's 90. 90 is not one of my perfect numbers. Okay, so what else can we do? 18 times, oh, I don't know, 10. That's 180. That won't work. What about 18 times 12? That's 216. 216 kind of looks like a pretty number to me, so I'm going to do 6 cubed. Is that 216? It is. I knew it looked familiar. So instead of multiplying top and bottom by cube root of 8 and a cube root of 8 and a cube root of 8 and a cube root of 8, instead, I'm going to multiply top and bottom by the cube root of 216. Oops, not 216. <laughs> that would be a very large number. Let's not do that. What did we want to multiply by? We wanted to multiply by 12. Again, why did we choose 12? Because 18 times 12 gives us that 216, and we can take the cube root of that. So in the numerator, I'm going to split this up. And the denominator. Two things are going to happen. In the numerator, we have to distribute by the cube root of 12. So we have 3 cube root of 5 minus 2. All of that is being multiplied by the cube root of 12. And we're going to take that cube root of 12, distribute it onto that negative 2, and distribute it onto that 3 cube root of 5. In the denominator, we're going to multiply. No distribution here because we do not have addition or subtraction. In the numerator, we had a minus, so subtraction. In the denominator, we just have straight multiplication. Let's do with the denominator first. We have 4 times the cube root of 18 times 12. This is using the product property because the index is the same. We can combine them inside. And once again, 18 times 12 is 216. So we have 4 times the cube root of 216. And we already know what the cube, uh, sorry, the cube root of 216 is, and that is 
6. So we have 4 times 6, which is 24. I'm going to go ahead and circle. Ooh, you guys can't see. I'm going to circle that number. This is in your denominator. That's not your answer. That just goes in the denominator. Now, in the numerator, we're going to distribute out that to 12. So we have 3 cube root of 5 times 12 minus 2 cube root of 12. Simplifying that out, 5 times 12 is 60. 3 cube root of 60 minus 2 cube root of 12. Now we do need to simplify if we can. Uh, doesn't mean always we can. We just need to at least check and make sure we're okay. So we're looking at 60. Can one of these perfect cubes factor into 60? Well, 60 divided by 27 is not a pretty number, and 60 divided by 8 is also not a pretty number. So 60 cannot be simplified. What about 12? Well, the only number that can go into 12 is potentially 8, and 8 and 12 do not get along. So this is your numerator. So how does our final answer look like? I'm going to write our answer here in the little answer box. Our answer looks like our numerator, 3 cube root of 60 minus 2 cube root of 12 divided by 24. And this is your answer. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next chunk. For the next section, we have multiplying, uh, or simplifying, excuse me, uh, which is multiplying by conjugates. Moving on to our next section, let's do question number 14. On question number 14, we have 5 square root of 5 minus 4 square root of 2, all divided by square root of 2 minus 2. Please do not, for any reason, start crossing anything out. You have a binomial divided by a binomial. You have two terms in the numerator separated by subtraction. You have two terms in the denominator separated by subtraction. This is extremely different than what we just did on the previous question. When you see a binomial in the denominator with a radical, your only option is to multiply by the conjugate. Now, what is a conjugate? The conjugate is when you take the binomial from your denominator, copy it down exactly how you see it, except for the middle symbol. So the symbol between the two terms that symbol is now going to be changed to opposite of what you see. So I see a minus, I'm going to be writing a plus, both for top and bottom, because we have to multiply by the same thing. And before you start multiplying things out, I encourage you to separate this out into your numerator, and then your denominator, and work at it separately, and then Give me your answer. So for your numerator, again, you have a binomial. So here's one term. Then we have another binomial. Sorry, and then and we have the other term of the binomial, which is 4 root 2. That is being multiplied by the square root of 2 plus 2. This is one term. This is another term with the minus. This is one term, and this is your other term with the plus. Make sure you take the symbols. Now, when you write this out as a binomial times a binomial, you have different options. You can FOIL, distribute. I choose to do a box method just because it helps me organize my thoughts. I'm going to write this out as 5 root 5. Again, do not break those apart. Those have to be grouped together. Negative 4 root 2. Do not break those apart. Those have to be together. Root 2 and a positive 2. I'm going to multiply these out. Again, outside with outside, inside with inside. So we have 5 square root of 5 times 2. That means we have 5 square root of 10. Here we have negative 4, excuse me, negative 4 times square root of 4. Simplify that out, we get negative 4 times 2, which gives us, whoop, throwing my pencils or pens around, negative 8. And I'm going to circle that one just because I don't want to get lost with what actually is my answer in that bubble. Uh, outside with outside, so we get 10 square root of 5. And then outside with outside, we get negative 8 square root of 2. Now, if you have the same inside, if you have the same inside of your radical and the same index, then yes, you can add them. But notice we have a square root of 2. 
with the square root of 5. Those are different. Those are not like terms. And the square root of 5 is not the square root of 10. So all three of these radicals are different. So how do we deal with that? We kind of don't. We just write them next to each other. Don't really do anything with them. So we have 5 square root of 10 plus 10 square root of 5 minus 8 square root of 2. Get those little tails. Minus 8. And this is what is in your numerator. I'm just going to circle that. That is not our answer. That's just what's in our numerator. Now for our denominator, again we have a binomial times a binomial. Now these two binomials are special because they are conjugates of each other. That means one of them is going to be addition, the other one's going to be subtraction of two. When that happens with conjugates, you have a pattern that is a squared minus b squared. When you have your denominator with the conjugates, this will always happen. So we have our a value of square root of two squared minus your b value, which is two squared. Simplifying that out, we get two minus four, so we get a negative two. Again, that is not your answer. That just is what is going in your denominator. So how do you write your answer? Well, let's combine the denominator and the numerator. We get five root 10 plus 10 root 5 minus 8 root 2 minus 8. All of that is being over negative 2. Now, if you leave this like this on the test, it's not the end of the world. It is in correct format because you have a negative in the denominator. Now, will I remove points from that? No, but when you move on in your mathematical journey, this is silly. So let's go ahead and fix that. To fix a negative one like this, it's imagine if you're factoring out a negative one out of every single thing. So if I remove a negative one from every single term in my numerator, I would get a negative five root 10, a negative 10 root five, a positive eight root two, and a positive eight. And then if I remove a negative one, I would be left with a positive two. Now that you have factored something out, we can get rid of it. So we can divide negative one divided by negative one is just one. So our actual answer in the correct form is negative five root 10 minus 10 root five plus eight root two plus eight, all divided by a positive two for your final answer. Let's shift that up so you guys can see it. Our next section is kind of two sections at the same time. It's writing each expression in exponential form and then writing each expression in radical form. So this is your conversions. Let's go ahead and work on question number 15 and then question number 17. For question number 15, it is asking us to write it in exponential form. So we are converting a radical into a rational exponent. And for 17, we're going the opposite way, is we have a rational exponent and we want a radical. So to convert, you're going to have an index. So if you don't see a number on your radical, that means that you have a square root, which means your index of two. You are going to have an exponent. And you have your index. So when you write it, you're gonna take whatever's inside whatever's being raised to that power. That's going to be your base. Then your exponent is always small and above. Do you see how we had a smaller three and it was kind of floating in the air? That's exactly what's gonna happen with our exponent. We're gonna write it small and above. Now, where do we place our index? Our index is going to be our denominator. So it's going to be 7k raised to the power of three halves. And this is your answer. Now going the opposite way, the other way, we have a rational exponent and let's convert it to a radical. You're gonna take your base and you're gonna create that as your radicand. That's your inside. So you can write this in two different ways. If you want to write your inside here, sometimes you have more than one thing in parentheses, you can. You're going to take your exponent and remember, your exponent is going to be small and above, 
And you can choose either to write it like we did here, completely on the outside, or you can choose to write it inside your radical. That is your choice. Both are correct. And then you take your denominator, which is your index. And your index goes inside that little V section in your radical. So we have the cube root of a to the first power. Moving on to the next section, I feel like this is uh, a difficult section for you guys, and that is simplifying expressions. And let's do question number 19. So simplifying expressions with rational exponents. So our question for number 19 is y to the 3 halves power x squared y to the 3 halves power divided by x squared y to the 4 thirds power. All of this is being raised to the third power. And one of the questions I get asked is, where do I start? Where do you start? And the best thing that I can recommend is start wherever you'd like to start. If you'd like to start by simplifying the numerator, start by simplifying the numerator. If you want to start by simplifying the denominator, you can start there, but I'll tell you with this example, there's nothing really to simplify in this denominator, but if there were, you can do it. Do you want to start by bringing in that three with the power of a power property? Absolutely do that. That is your choice. The only thing that I would say is do not, for any reason, deal with negatives until the very last step. Your negatives should be something the very last thing you do if you need to take reciprocals of things. Do that last. Don't do that first. Don't be moving things around. So I'm going to choose to rewrite and combine my y's in my numerator. Now, if you didn't want to do that step, you do you, and then we can compare our answers. I'm just writing them next to each other first, kind of rearranging things. And since I placed my two y's here, I'm also going to write my y underneath that, kind of grouping things together. And we still have that three on the outside. When we multiply bases that are the same, we are adding the exponents together. Now, when you add the exponents together, because they are fractions, they must have common denominators. Now, in this example, both y's have an exponent of 3 halves, which is the same denominator. So we can just proceed by adding. So we have 3 plus 3, which is 6. Remember, when you're adding, do not add the denominator. The denominator stays the same. Just add the, the numerator in your exponent. Then we have x squared. Now I do realize that 6 halves can be simplified. I'm just going to wait to do that. And we still have that exponent of 3 on the outside. Moving on, let's go ahead and simplify that y 6 halves to just 3. And the way that I'm doing this right here, beautiful people, is I am going to split them up. just like that. Now again, you don't have to split them up in this step. I choose to because I like to see my y's over y's and my x's over x's or whatever letters they give us. And I'm going to be bringing in my 3. Now that 3 is a power with a power, meaning we are going to multiply all of my exponents. Even if you don't have one, that exponent is 1. So every single thing inside does have an exponent, even if you don't see it. So that 3 is going to be going on all of my exponents. So we got 3 times 3 is 9. Here we have times 3 over 1. So we have 12 thirds. And again, we can't simplify that. We'll do that in a little bit. Times... 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times 3 is 6. Now, I'm not putting an exponent of 3 in a bubble around here, parentheses, because we've just handled it, so we don't have to write that 3. 
Going to simplify that out one more time. So we have y to the ninth power divided by y to the fourth power times. Now I am noticing I have x to the sixth power divided by x to the sixth power. You can handle the x to the sixth power of these in different ways. You can proceed with the quotient property and subtract the exponents, giving you x to the zeroth power. Or you can just see, hey, this is the same thing. This is just 1. And we do need to still use that quotient property. And that quotient property says we still need to subtract. So I like to, when I use the quotient property, I like to put a little fraction bar to say, hey, when I'm using the quotient property, everything goes to the numerator. So we have top minus bottom. And then if in the event that my exponent becomes negative, then I can move it to the denominator. So we have 9 minus 4, which is 5. And so we have y to the fifth power. It doesn't look like I have anything else left. So that is our answer. And that is for our next section from 19 through 24. Let's move on to our next section, which is solving equations. Now, there are different equations that you're going to be taxed to solve. You're going to be solving equations with radicals. You're also going to be solving equations with rational exponents. Now, remember, a radical is a rational exponent. Those are the same thing. So if you don't like dealing with exponential fractions, convert it to a radical. Or, if you don't like working with a radical, convert it to an exponential fraction. It's your choice. So let's go ahead, and I'll do a few questions here because they're, they're different. Uh, let's start off with question number 26. Question number 26 says negative 6 equals negative 6 times the square root of 11 minus 2v. Step number one is you want to get your radical by itself. You only have one radical. There are numbers outside of that radical that need to be removed. In this case, it is a negative 6 that is being multiplied, so we have to divide by negative 6. So it gives us 1 is equal to the square root of 11 minus 2v. This step, we need to undo the radical by multiplying by whatever index we have. This is a square root. The index is 2, so we need to square it. If we had a cube root, then we would cube both sides. If we have a fourth root, we would raise it to the fourth power of both sides. So we have 1 squared, which is just 1. These go away, so we just have 11 minus 2v. And now we continue solving. I'm going to subtract 11 giving me negative 10 is equal to negative 2v. Divide by negative 2, divide by negative 2, v is equal to a positive 5. Maybe. Get into the habit of always checking your answers. Sometimes in math, when we are dealing with solving radicals, it's one of those things where we're like, ha, got you, just kidding. No, it's not actually your answer. And you're actually, when you're graphing, it's going to be complex. It doesn't actually touch the x-intercept. So just check your answer. How do you check? When you check, you just plug in into the original equation your value and check if it works. Now, on the exam, I don't need to see your checks. However, your answers will depend on your checks. On the test or the exam, you will have extraneous solutions, meaning answers that don't actually work. So please make sure to double check all of your answers and make sure that you know which ones work. So let's go ahead and do this. We got 11 minus 2 times 5, and that gives me 1. So negative 6, square root of 1, that just gives me negative 6 times 1. So we already know that that checks out. So it's not a maybe, it's a yes, that works. Let's try a different method. We have question number 27. Now when you see two radicals and nothing else,
So you have two radicals, nothing else. You don't have anything outside the radical. So here's my radical. I don't have anything outside it. I'm not adding, subtracting outside the radical. I'm not multiplying outside the radical. There's nothing else. This is where you can use your square both sides method. Gives us m plus 1 is equal to 9m plus 1 and solve. I'm going to subtract m here. I'm going to subtract 1 here. So we get 0 is equal to uh, 8m. Divide by 8, divide by 8. m is equal to 0. Perhaps. Perhaps m is equal to 0. Let's go ahead and check if indeed it equals 0. We got 0 plus 1 is maybe equal to 9 times 0 plus 1. Both are square rooted, and indeed we end up getting a square root of 1 equals the square root of 1. That checks out, and indeed m is equal to 0. Now the third type of solving equations that you're going to do is going to be with numbers outside the radical, like a binomial. So let's do question number 36. We got the square root of 6x minus 5 minus the square root of 4x minus 4 equals 1. So the difference between what we just did and what we just wrote down this one here only had two radicals with no other numbers outside the radical. These have two radicals, but notice we have a 1. So that means there is a number outside of a radical. It changes everything. Step number one, we want to isolate one of those radicals. Now I'm going to choose to add the square root of 4x minus 4 to both sides. Nothing really happens, we're just moving it to the other side. So we have the square root of 6x minus 5 equal to 1 plus the square root of 4x minus 4. I'm going to draw my arrows because it kind of shifted. So this right here is here, and then this one we're just bringing down. Now we're doing exactly the same step that we did previously. We're going to square both sides, but be extremely careful because now we end up with a binomial. Here's one term, here's another term. This is a binomial. So when we square both sides, on our left-hand side, it ends up being exactly what we expect. The index of 2 and the exponent of 2 undo each other, so we have 6x minus 5 on that side. It does what it's supposed to. However, on the other side, because we have a binomial, we end up having 1 plus the square root of 4x minus 4 times 1 plus the square root of 4x minus 4. We have a binomial times a binomial. This needs to be FOIL, distribute, or box method. I personally like the box method. I think with the, with the uh, number being 1, it's a little bit easier to do distribution, but let's go ahead and do a box method here. If you want to distribute, you have my blessing. So when you write these out for the distribution, be careful. Also, if you know your patterns, you can just use your patterns. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. There's a video for that. Make sure that you write it out. Everything inside the radical is one thing. You can't undo the radical. It's kind of what we're trying to do. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times the square root of 4x minus 4 is 4x minus 4. And then we got 1 times 4x minus 4 is 4x minus 4. If you want to do that 1 times, you can. It's your choice. And then we have 4x minus 4 square rooted, squared. So that just gives us 4x minus 4. So on the left-hand side, we still have that. Let's shift this up so you guys can see. 6x minus 5 equals, and then we're going to combine these 
to 1 plus 2 square rooted of, oops, that should be a 4x minus 4. And then we still have a positive 4x minus 4. These two right here we're going to add. This one we're going to bring down, and these we're going to bring down. Combining like terms further, we got 6x minus 5 is equal to 1 plus 2 times the square root of 4x minus 4. I'm going to highlight this because I'm seeing that uh, in class you guys are adding these things together. These cannot be added together. So we got a 2 times 4x minus 4. That's grouped together by multiplication. You cannot undo that. So just leave that be. And I'm going to actually erase that 1 right here. We're going to add or technically subtract 1 minus 4, which is that negative 3. And then we have this positive 4x. I'm going to remove them, so I'm going to add 3 to both sides. And I'm going to subtract 4x both sides as well. These go away. These go away. We have 2x minus 2. Here we still have that 2 square root of 4x minus 4. I'm going to shift this a little down so you guys can see it. There it is. Pausing here for a moment. Our next step again is to get the radical by itself. So when you are dividing by 2, be extremely careful. You are dividing every single term by 2. And I'm running out of space here, so I'm going to shift to a different paper. And so we are at the step of dividing by 2. On our left hand side, we have 2x minus 2. On our right hand side, we have 2 square root of 4x minus 4. When we divide it by 2, we have to divide every single thing by 2. So that means on our left-hand side, we have x minus 1 left over. And on our right-hand side, we have 4x minus 4 square rooted. But Ms. Romadias, we're supposed to get rid of the radical. It didn't get rid of the radical. I know. But it got rid of one of the radicals. So when you get to this step, guess what? you got to do it all over again. So you're going to square both sides. Once again, you have a binomial. So that means you're going to have to write out your bubble twice. And on the right-hand side, you have now 4x minus 4. So the radical, the last radical, the second radical, does end up disappearing. But we still have to multiply this out. I'm going to choose to distribute. So we have x times x, that's x squared, minus 1x, minus 1x, plus 1 is equal to 4x minus 4. Combining like terms, if you know your patterns, you can skip this middle step. Bring everything over to one side because you do have a quadratic. So I'm going to subtract 4x, add 4. So we end up with a quadratic, 4, 5, 6, negative, and 5. Here you have an option. You can either choose to do quadratic formula to solve, or you can choose to factor. I'm going to choose to factor. I think it'd be faster. x minus 5 and x minus 6. Ooh, that would have been a mistake. 1. 1 times 5 is 5. Negative 5 plus a negative 1 is a negative 6. So we have x is equal to 5, positive, and x is equal to positive 1. Again, these are our maybes. We have to check if they actually work. Now, which one do we check in? You always want to check with the original equation. What number were we doing? We were doing question number 36. So on question number 36 for your check, We had the square root of 6x minus 5 minus the square root of 4x minus 4. Is that equal to 1? That's our check. So if we plug in 5, I'm not going to be writing this down because I don't have space. 
but we're going to be plugging in 5. So 6 times 5 is 30 minus 5, that's 25. 4 times 5 is 20 minus 4 is 16. So we have, maybe I should write it down, we have 25 square rooted minus square root of 16. That means we had 5 minus 4. Does that equal to 1? Yes. So 5 does work for question number 36. And then let's check for 1. 6 times 1 is 6. 6 minus 5 is 1. Oops, that should be a minus. 4 times 1 is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. So we do have 1 equals 1. Now notice my check is very basic. There's not much writing in it. I don't need to see work for your check, but I do need to see if you checked. And I will know if you check because there will be extraneous solutions on the test. So please make sure to write which one is extraneous and which one is not. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next section, which is solving for your inequalities. All right, beautiful people, moving on to uh, question number 38. Now, for question number 38, notice that we are moving from equations to inequalities. So we have negative 21 is greater or equal to negative 3 times the square root of 3 minus 23x. Now, step number one, when you are solving inequalities, you're going to take the radicate. and you're going to set that equal to zero. Now, what's a radicand? That is the inside of your radical. So your radicand is going to be the inside. So step number one, 3 minus 23x is equal to zero. We're going to solve for x. So I'm going to subtract 3, subtract 3. Negative 23x is equal to negative 3 divide by negative 23, divide by negative 23. Decimals are not allowed, so we keep it as a fraction. So we got 3 over 23. Now right here, we're going to pause. Don't do anything with that x yet, okay? Step number two, you're going to solve. So you are going to create an equation from your inequality. So exactly the same thing, but you're now going to be putting an equal sign and you're going to solve for x. So we're going to divide by negative 3, divide by negative 3. We have 7 is equal to the square root. And I'm over here doubting myself using a calculator. That's silly. Square both sides. So we have 49 is equal to 3 minus 23x. Again, we're going to continue solving for x. I'm going to subtract 3. We got 46 is equal to a negative 23x. Dividing by negative 23, we get a negative 2. Again, don't do anything with this value right now. We're going to pause. Step number 3, we're going to test on a number line. So draw out just your standard number line. You're going to then place your two x values. So I get a first one of negative 2, and the second one is 3 23rds, which is about a little over 1. Now, realistically, I don't really care um, if it's where it is on the number line as long as it's correct. For example, this is negative 2, so I'm going to put it on the left. This is a positive number, so I'm going to put it on the right. Whenever you do this, you're always going to create three sections that you're going to need to test. You have section number one, you have section number two, and you have section number three. You're going to test each section, a number in each section, to see if it's a true or a false statement. Now, you don't have to test a lot of numbers, just one from each section. So we're going to say negative 21 greater than or equal to negative 3, the square root of 3 minus 23 x, and then we're going to test that out. 
So inside of that x, I'm going to choose to test a negative 3. And I'm going to just use my calculator here for 3 minus 23 times a negative 3. That gives me a square root of 72 times negative 3 is perhaps less than negative 21. So again, I'm using a calculator. This is just a test, so you can use a calculator on this, especially if it's square root. And we're trying to see, is this a true statement? 21 is greater than or equal to, maybe, the negative 25.5-ish? No, that's false. Is it false or is it true? That is true. <gasps> Beautiful people, I almost made a mistake. Negative 25 is smaller and negative 21 is bigger. That is true because it is more negative. So this is true. Next we're going to text our middle. So in the middle between a negative number and a positive number, I'm going to choose 0. Hopefully 0 will get us somewhere. Just copying it down. And here we're going to write in 0. So we have negative 21 is greater than or equal to, again, this is all maybes, negative 3 times the square root of 3. Now, is that smaller than negative 21? Well, let's check. Negative 3 times the square root, oops, wrong button, times the square root of 3. Is that smaller than negative 21? No. So negative 21 is not bigger or equal to a negative 5. So this is false. And then the last one we have for our third check is we're going to rewrite the question one more time, or the inequality one more time. And we're going to check for something larger than 3 23rds. And again, I'm going to try to stay with a pretty number or something small, so I'm going to just choose 1. So we want it bigger than 3 23rds. If we use a calculator, 3 23rds is very small, so I'm going to choose 1. Negative 21. And again, beautiful people, if you want to use a calculator for this, you have my blessing. You got negative 3 square root of 3 minus 23 times 1. Make sure you do double parentheses if you do that. Oh, what did I do? I did something wrong. Too many parentheses, not enough parentheses. Oh, that's even giving me an error. Do you guys see that? That's an error because we end up getting a negative number inside. So this is definitely not it. This is false. So then what's our answer? Our answer is either a inequality, I'll do a little answer box here, or our answer is a interval. I hesitated there for a second. I'm like, what is it called? An interval. So either it's an inequality or an interval. For your interval answer, we're going to go from the section that's true. So from negative infinity with parentheses all the way up to negative 2. Now we're going to go back to our original symbol. This is a greater than or equal to. So because it is or equal to, this is included. So we have to use a bracket. If you are choosing to do a inequality, then we can do y. And instead of y, sorry, we should be doing x. Let me see if I can find a eraser here real quick in the form of a whiteout. Is it going to work today? I might have to scribble. Oh, look at that. It did work. Okay, so let's do x. Apologize for that. x is greater than or equals to, and it's not greater than, beautiful people, we're doing great today. Let's try this again. X is smaller than or equal to 
negative 2. Because we are going towards the left, towards the negative infinity, x is going to be smaller, not larger. All right, let's move on to the next one. Now, when we're dealing with a rational exponent, we want to get the grouping or the bubble, the binomial by itself with the exponent. So just like in integrated math one, we're going to add nine to both sides. So we have 1080 now. We still have that five times 24 minus two V raised to the three halves power. We're going to divide by five, divide by five, so we have 1,080 divided by 5, and that gives us 216. Now, on the left-hand side, we still have our rational exponent. So here is the step that you do to get rid of that rational exponent. The reason we want to get rid, rid of the rational exponent is because we cannot go inside the parentheses when we have this exponent. This exponent is like a key and a lock. In order to undo this locked door, we have to find a key. And that key is going to be raising both sides to the reciprocal power. Now I am drawing this little carrot just to show you, uh, be very obvious in showing you that it is an exponent that we're doing on both sides. We're gonna take this exponent, this three halves, and we're going to raise it to the reciprocal power. So this is two thirds. So what happens is we have 3 divided by 3, 2 divided by 2, and by multiplying by the reciprocal, raising it to the reciprocal power, which is the power of a power property, we are undoing, redoing, simplifying the exponent. So we got 24 minus 2v left over. Now on this side, you have a choice to make. You can either do this by hand. I recommend using a calculator. When you type this in, type it in exactly how you see it. However, when you type in your exponent, because it is a fraction, in your calculator you must put that in parentheses. Otherwise your calculator will give you something wrong. And then we press enter. Now this theoretically should give you a pretty answer because we are giving you questions with pretty numbers like this. And now we're back in integrated math one. We're going to solve. I'm going to subtract 24, subtract 24. Negative 2v is equal to 12. Divide by negative 2. v is then equal to a negative 6. Now again, please make sure to check your answers. Sometimes they will work, sometimes they will not always get into the habit of check your answer. Now, with something like this, I do actually recommend just plugging into the calculator and checking. Make sure that when you're plugging this into the calculator, you have all the correct parentheses. For example, this three halves will still need to be in parentheses, otherwise your calculator will give you the wrong answer. So how to check, I'm just gonna type this in as negative nine plus five, parentheses, 24 minus two, now I'm gonna put a separate parentheses for my negative six, that is my input. Double parentheses, caret, open parentheses for the three halves. I'm gonna press enter, and that does give me 1,071, which checks out, so I'm gonna put a little check mark there. Moving on to the next section, which is solving with radicals. I'm gonna be moving on to question number, oh, I don't know, let's do question number Let's do 46 just because I see a fraction on it. Question number 46. Oh, actually, you know what? Learn to read the instructions, Ms. Romadias. It actually doesn't ask us to solve. I was looking at it, I was like, well, that's weird. Uh, number 46 asks us, asks us, excuse me, to identify the domain and range of each, then sketch the graph. So let's go ahead and still do 46. So we got y equals 3 fifths times the square root of x plus five minus two. So let's start by identifying the domain and range. Uh, it really is, I promise you guys, uh, to find the limitations, to find the restrictions on the domain and range for a square root, it really is just finding your endpoint. So because we have a square root, there is a limitation on the domain and range. Finding your endpoint, your h comma k, 
will tell you what the restrictions are, remember H is opposite, on that domain. So this is the domain restriction. And this is your range restriction. And then you're looking at the A value, you're looking at the three-fifths, and you're not necessarily looking if it's a fraction or a whole number, you're looking if it's positive or negative. Think back to our chapter three, when we were graphing polynomials, we were looking at the leading coefficient to check if it's positive, negative. Is this increasing or decreasing? Because it is increasing, we know that the domain restriction will be from negative five all the way to infinity, and the range restriction is going to be from negative two all the way to infinity. Why do we know it's positive infinity? Because this is an increasing function, it is positive. So that's how we do domain and range. Let's go ahead and draw it out to confirm our answers. When you're here, do a quick little t-chart. Typically, we're looking for about three points. We're going to write out our endpoint, which is negative 5, negative 2. Now, what are we putting into x? We want pretty numbers into x, things that we can take the square root of. So I'm going to separate, in a thinking bubble, a mini equation. This mini equation is I'm taking the inside of the radical, and I'm going to set it to 1. The reason I'm going to set it to 1 is because I can take the square root of 1. That is something that I can do. And I'm going to subtract 5. So x is equal to a negative 4. So that means when we plug in negative 4 into our radical, that will give us a 1. We can take the square root of 1. Square root of 1 times 3 fifths is 3 fifths. And then we have negative 2 and 3 fifths. Now, negative 4, we can take the square root of, when we plug it in, we can take the square root of 1. But when I multiply by 3 fifths, that doesn't necessarily give us a pretty answer. So we might have to go back in and find a prettier input to get a prettier output. So if we do 3 fifths minus 2 on the calculator, it will give you a decimal. Now the decimals are not the end of the world when you're graphing, um, but we definitely don't want hopefully I'll be able to put in a little warning for that bell if you heard it. Alright, let's find a prettier input. So here's what you can do. You can do your little mini equations here, or you can just simply plug and check. I'm okay, you have accessibility to a calculator. Plug and check some numbers. And let's see. We tried negative four, that didn't work. Let's try negative six. So what happens when we type in negative six? So if I typed in negative six, notice that there is a domain error in our calculator. Recall that we have a domain restriction. Domain talks about your x values. So we are restricted to negative 5. Because if we plug in negative 6, that gives me a negative 1 inside the radical. We cannot take the square root. Now we can take the cube root, but that's not what we have here. We can't take the square root of a negative number. So instead of typing in negative 6, I'm going to go the opposite way and type in negative 3. That's still not pretty. Negative 2. Still not pretty. Negative 1. Eh, not the worst thing, but also still not the prettiest. So we're going to keep chugging along. Still not pretty. Eh, we might have to deal with some decimals. Or it might be just a larger number. Again, I'm writing these down. What was this? A positive 4. But again, these are not the prettiest things. Mm, that still didn't work. And I'm just waiting here to find a pretty number. Oops, do you guys see that? I did make a mistake here. Got to insert a plus symbol. 
Now, instead of guessing and checking like this, what we can do is we can solve the original. So I'm, that's what I'm going to do because it looks like plugging and chugging numbers is not working out for us. So I'm going to solve another one. I need something when I square root it to be divisible by 5. So I'm going to say x plus 5 is equal to 25. Now, the reason I'm choosing 25 because the square root of 25 is 5, and then I can divide by this 5. So I'm going to subtract 5, subtract 5, x is equal to 20. So we're going to jump here to 20, plugging that in to our calculator, and we get 1. So this is the pretty number that we're looking for. Now you can graph the rest, and by can, we can approximate, guesstimate where these are. So it's definitely easier, as you saw, to do your little mini equations to get your pretty numbers underneath the radical. So we got negative 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 2. That is your end point. Make sure you identify that's your end point. Then we got 20 and 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Let's extend it. Shift this up. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 1. And again, we can 1, 2, 3, 4 do the other ones. We got 1 and a little bit. We got negative 1, 1 and a little bit more. We got 1, 2, 3, 4. Still smaller. So there's another bell. And I have a feeling there's going to be one more in one minute. So we're going we're gonna to pause here for a second and come back in one minute. Actually, before we do that, that's your graph. Make sure it's pointing to the right. Uh, make sure it is smooth and it, make sure it has that limitation. And I'm counting down the seconds before the bell rings one more time so I can pause this video. Again, domain is restricted. So we're looking at our end value at negative 5 comma infinity because it's going all the way to the right. And for the range, we're looking at negative 2 comma infinity because it's starting at negative 2 on the y-axis. Make sure it has brackets around the number and it has parentheses. All right, I will come back in just a few seconds. And we're back. All right, so let's go in and summarize. When we have a square root function that we're trying to graph, the first thing you're going to do is find the endpoint. The endpoint is your h comma k. Remember, h is always opposite of what you see. You're going to take your h comma k, and those are going to be your domain and range restrictions. This only happens on the square root, the even functions. It does not happen on the uh, cube root. With our endpoint, we're going to plug and check some numbers, thinking in our brain pretty numbers, perfect squares that we can take the square root of inside the radical. So the first one I tried is 1. Why did I try 1? Because the square root of 1 is 1. That is something we can do. As I try to plug and chug because of this fraction, things were not giving me a pretty y value. They're giving me decimals or fractions. So I went ahead and I did another thinking bubble. And this time I chose to set the inside equal to 25. Why are we choosing to set it equal to 25? Well, because I can take the square root of 25. The square root of 25 is just 5. And I'm looking at the denominator and I needed a number that can be divisible by 5. I know the square root of 25 is 5 and 5 divided by 5 can be simplified. So that meant I needed to plug in an x value of 20. When I plugged 20 in, that gave me an output of 1. We were able to graph it. For our domain, we have the negative 5 with a bracket all the way to infinity going to the right, negative 2 all the way up to infinity going up. Let's go ahead and do another one. Looking at a cube root, so I'm looking at question number... 47, we got y equals 2 thirds times the cube root of x minus 1 minus 4. Same thing like we did in question number 46. We do have an h and k value. However, this is not your end point. This is your point of inflection. So we get a positive 1, remember h is opposite of what you see, and a negative 4. Now with a cube root, there are no limitations on the domain. There are no limitations on the range. So you can plug in whatever you'd like. So I'm going to start off with my point of inflection. I'm going to write that in the middle. Give it a quick little circle. And inside 
my little thinking bubbles, I'm going to start doing mini equations. So I'm going to take that x minus 1 that is inside the radical, and I'm going to set it to pretty numbers that I can take a cube root of. For example, the cube root of 1 is 1, so I'm going to place a 1 here. That means that I can input 2 into my cube root. Now just like before, be careful. Because you have a fraction here, you might have to go outside of 1 and negative 1 for your pretty values. So let's go ahead and give this a shot. Now if you're typing this into the calculator, that's fine, but you are going to have to convert this to a rational exponent. So if you're doing 2 thirds, make sure this is in parentheses. And then we have times the cube root. And instead of doing a cube root, we're going to do the rational exponent. So I'm going to convert this to a fraction. Now the reason we didn't have to do that for the um, square root is because we do have a square root button. One third, just like that, minus four. And then you can plug and shut. Or there is a button that looks like this right here the one that I'm pointing to with my pen. So in order to get that button, you're going to press second and you're going to press that button. Now do you see how it says answer and then it has a little x? So whatever number you're writing in there first, that's the index that you have. So this is the index of three. So if we wanted to take the cube root of eight, that's how we do it. Again, let's do it again. So we have a cube root of eight. So if you're choosing to do that on a calculator, then you're still going to have to put three halves in parentheses, otherwise it's going to do something weird to your index. And then you're going to do that three, you're gonna press second, and then you're gonna press the caret button, and then you're gonna type in that x minus one close that parentheses, and then minus four. So let's do that together. We got two thirds. You're gonna press three in parentheses. You're gonna do the second with a caret button, so that gives you that cube root. Next, you're gonna type in your x value. What did we say? We said two, and this one doesn't give you parentheses, so make sure that you put in parentheses. 2 minus 1, close the parentheses, close the other parentheses. As you can see, this is going to be so much easier just to do it by hand. But if you are really wanting to use a calculator, you can. Oh, and I think I put in one too many parentheses. There it goes. So as you can see, inputting a 2 does not give us a pretty number. It gives us a negative 3.3. .3. So we don't want to use 2. So again, you can choose to plug and check some numbers, or you can get perfect cubes that just make sense. So for example, I'm going to set x minus 1 equal to 27. Why 27? Because we can take the cube root of 27, and the cube root of 27, 3, can be divided by 3. So I'm going to subtract 1, subtract 1, we get x equals 26. So I'm going to input 26 here. I'm going to go back in here. Instead of 2, I'm going to press 2nd, delete, which gives me an insert button. There it is. And I'm going to type in 26, delete that original 2, press enter, and that still didn't give me a pretty answer, which I am confused as to why. So let's go ahead and see. Oh, because I'm supposed to add C. Let's try this again. This should be 28. So I'm glad that it gave me an icky answer because it helped me catch my mistake. There we go, negative 2. Now, with a cube root, you want to make sure you have three points. You want to go into one direction or the other direction. It's like, imagine Mr. John Travolta being pushed on his side. So we want to go into the other direction, so I'm going to do one more. And instead of doing a positive, I'm going to do a negative 27, because we can still take a cube root of a negative number. Adding one, adding one, and we got a negative 26 equals x. I'm going to go back up here. We're going to insert insert a negative 26, deleting the original 28 that we had, pressing enter, and that gives me a negative 6. So negative 28.
26 gives me a negative 6. And now we're ready to graph. Okay, start off with your point of inflection at 1 and negative 4. We know it's going to be pointing to the right and to the left because the, they are cube roots and square roots. They always point to the right and to the left. So this one here is going to be at 28 and negative 2. So we're going to guesstimate that 28 is here and a negative 2 is here. And then negative 26. And I'm guesstimating just so I don't have to do all the tick marks here in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right over here. Now again, it should, when you've lined up your points, it should look like they're going to make a line. So if we were connecting this like a straight line, it should line up, no pun intended. But we know better because we know that this is the parent function is a cubic. So we're going to have to point to the right and to the left. Put your marker on the center point on the point of inflection. We're going to curve up and to the right. We're going to curve down and to the left. So we have our function. Now let's talk about domain and range. Now for a cubic and a cube root, the domain has no restrictions and the range has no restrictions. So you can write literally in English all real numbers. You can give me a math notation. You can give me uh, a interval, which is what I'm going to do, from negative infinity to positive infinity and from negative infinity to positive infinity. Again, a cube root has no limitations. It's all real numbers. A square root does have limitations, so we have to make sure to do that. Just one, two more sections that we have, three more sections that we have to do. Let's go ahead and do composition of functions. So for compositions of functions, let's do example number 54. So we have g of x is equal to negative 2x cubed plus 4 f of x is equal to 4x minus 2. Please be really, really, really careful. You want to make sure that how you're reading it and how you're writing it makes you place the correct function into the correct function. So what you see first is what we're going to be placing in. So we are putting into the function g of x. And what are we putting in is f of x. Step number one is you're going to write out your first function, in this case, g of x. So g, oop, not f, g. Next, you're going to write out what they want. They want g of f of x, and that's equal to negative 2. Now, instead of writing x, you're going to write a big bubble. Everything else gets copied down. In place of x, so here's your x. In place of x, we now have f of x. So you're going to take your f of x function and you're going to write that inside the parentheses. Now be extremely careful because this one specifically is a cubic. So you have a choice to make. Do you want to use Pascal's triangle to expand or do you just want to multiply? I highly encourage you to write out your three bubbles so that way you don't accidentally start putting three into the parentheses because that's a huge no-no. I'm going to choose to just simply multiply out. I don't want to use Pascal's triangle. Usually I wait until like there's an exponent of four, five, six to use Pascal's triangle. So I'm just going to multiply two of these at a time. Four times four is 16. X squared. Four times negative two is a negative eight. Negative two times four is a negative eight. If you know your patterns, just use your patterns. And then negative two times two is a positive four. Now, I am running a little bit out of space. This looks a little bit squished. I apologize for that. I'm going to give myself more space. Now, I'm going to be multiplying these out here. So, we have 16 times 4. 16 times 4 is 64. Oops. 64. X times X is X cubed. 
4 times negative 8 is a negative 32. X times X is X squared. What I'm doing right now, beautiful people, is I'm distributing that 4. If you wish to use the um, box method, you can. Also, if you wanted to simplify this to a negative 16, you can. I'm just choosing to multiply and then simplify everything out. So we got another 4 times negative 8, which is negative 32. And then we have 4 times 4, which is 16X. Now, I still have to go and do the same thing for a negative 2. And I promised to give myself more space, and it looks like I didn't give me myself more space. So I'm going to rewrite this here. We had negative 2, 64x cubed minus 32x squared minus 32x squared plus 16x. Now we're multiplying that negative 2. 16 times negative 2 is negative 32x squared. Then we have negative 2 times negative 8. That's a positive 16x positive 16x again, and a negative 8. Now we still have that positive 4 on the outside. I'm going to cross this out so it doesn't get confusing. Simplifying combined like terms, make sure you keep that negative 2 on the outside of the parentheses right now. So we have 64x cubed. I have a positive 32x squared, a positive 32x squared, and sorry, negative 32x squared, negative 32, and a negative 32. So 32 times 3, we get a negative 96x squared. I'm going to just cross these out, saying that I actually did handle them. I got 16, 16, and 16. So that gives me a positive 48x. These are gone. And then negative 8. The reason I'm crossing this out is just to let me know what we already simplified. Get the negative 2 in first before you do any addition. So we got 64 times a negative 2, which gives me a negative 128x cubed. 96 times 2 gives me a positive 192x squared. 48 times 2 gives me a negative 96x. And 8 times 2 gives me a positive 16. Now you can add that 4. 16 plus 4 is 20. Copying this down. Shifting it up. Oops. Just copying it down. I need to actually add these. 20. And that is equal to. Make sure you give me a complete sentence. Just like you do in English class. you got to do it in math class. Don't just give me floating numbers. And we have your function. I'm going to go ahead and double check my symbols, making sure that everything is okay on these symbols. I'm also going to double check my answer here real quick. So we have a negative 128x cubed, positive 192x squared, minus 96x plus 20. Double check my answer. We are solid. Okay, so that was question number 54. We have two more sections to do. Let's move on to question number 55. For question number 55, it is asking us to find the inverse of the function. So we have g of x is equal to negative x plus 15 divided by 10. Step number one is making sure that you convert to a y. Next, you're going to switch your x and y. So your y becomes your x, and your x becomes your y. Next, you're going to solve for your new y. So I'm going to multiply by 10, multiply by 10. We got 10x. And I'm going to put parentheses around 10x. Know that any time you do a step, there are uh, secret parentheses that show up. Sometimes you don't see it. So we got 10x minus 15. And again, I'm being a little extra with my parentheses because sometimes you do have to distribute out things. And then we're going to divide by negative 1. So here's an example where you are dividing by negative 1 on all of your terms. So how does it look like? We have negative 10. Let me bring an arrow up here, plus 15. 
is equal to y. Now remember our discussion from class. We cannot actually set this equal to y. y already has been assigned to this negative x plus 15 divided by 10. So we have to assign our inverse to the inverse function. So you're going to... Let's do question number 60. So we have g of x is equal to 4 over x minus 2 minus 1, and f of x is equal to 4 over x plus 1 plus 2. Start off with our f of g of x. That means we're writing out f. Here's our f function. I'm going to be putting parentheses where our x is. And then inside of f, I'm putting g. Let's go ahead and simplify. Notice right here, we have subtraction and addition of 1. So we can just subtract them. This one right here, we have keep, change, oops, change, and then flip. Now I do have that positive 2 still on the outside. Don't worry about that right now. We're going to keep, change, flip our fraction. So we're going to keep, change this to multiplication, and flip this to x minus 2 divided by 4, and then we still have that positive 2 on the outside. And if they are inverses, beautiful people, things just work out. So 4 divided by 4 is 1. We are left with x minus 2 plus 2. 2 and 2, they go together, and we have x. This does not say anything yet. Great, it's x. So what? The only way that we can confirm inverses is if both f of g of x and g of f of x are both equal to x. This tells you nothing right now. So it could still be a yes, they are inverses. They can still be a no, they are inverses. This is going to be the deciding factor. We have to do both. So now I'm writing out g. And inside of g, we are placing f. Just like before, take a look. We have 2 and 2. That can be simplified. So we have 4 over 4x plus 1 minus 1. Keep change flip. So we have 4 times x plus 1 divided by 4 minus 1. And that gives us 4 and 4 go away. x plus 1 minus 1 gives us x. And now because both of them, this one and where's the other one? This one, both of them are equal to x, we can say yes, they are in fact inverses. All right, beautiful people, that's it for chapter four. Keep in mind, I did not do all questions. I just did some questions from each section. I will have a, are you ready? practice test emailed out. So keep a lookout for that. Please make sure to do all questions. Come in for tutoring if you need any help on them. And then we will score really well on our test. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.